recording. So we left off yesterday um, discussing some of the civil rights movement uh, going into the 1960s, uh, how that really picked up steam through the 1950s into the 1960s. Uh, the space race, we, we, we discussed some as well, um, kind of flew through that as far as the progress that was made through the 60s, particularly in the United States with the space program uh, and, and how that led to um, uh, landing on the moon uh, and putting a man on the moon before the end of the 60s. It was um, <laughs> safe. Um, uh, oh, don't worry about it. That was... Uh, Done under the well, it was it was pushed by Kennedy. I should put it that way. Uh, he had made a speech about reach, going to the moon before the end of the decade, uh, which really put some, some pressure on NASA, uh, who had just started sending people into space, uh, and now we're talking about going, you know, thousands of miles to the moon, uh, hundreds of thousands, I think. Um, so really the amount of, of technological progress through the 60s is seen there. And of course, uh, we, uh, uh, JFK is assassinated on November 22nd, 1963, and Lyndon B. Johnson succeeds him. He was his vice president. That's who I want to talk a little bit about today and some of his exploits as president. Um, and then, of course, uh, the continuing civil rights movement, desegregation uh, at universities. Um, James Meredith was the first stu black student at uh, Southern Mississippi. Uh, and then the, 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 the uh, March on Washington, D.C., which was a huge moment uh, in that movement uh, with Martin Luther King Jr., uh, his speech uh, at the end of that march, um, his I Have a Dream speech, which is very, uh, you know, which is widely quoted. Um, and something that we discuss uh, quite often. So turning to some of the other issues that we didn't get to uh, in the 60s, um, and one that we have discussed before in class, because we looked at some, some text, uh, some writing about the Cuban Missile Crisis. So uh, just to start there um, and, and take me sort of a step back again into the Kennedy administration, uh, and this event that uh, almost uh, was the closest probably next to, there was one event in the 1980s, but the closest that the globe ever saw to nuclear war was this 14 days uh, between October and November of 1962 uh, and what sparked it. So the initial, initial tension uh, was created when uh, the United States moved ballistic missiles into Turkey and Italy. So the Turkey and Italy were uh, both allies, of course, the United States. Uh, they were part of, I think already at that time, part of NATO. So if you listen to the news from time to time, you might hear NATO, which is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And it's a number of um, countries. It is the probably the longest at this point, point but certainly the most successful collective defense agreement, an organization that's existed. And um, the idea behind that is basically that, you know, we have this, um, you know, agreement. Uh, and of course, you, you, you know, probably can already see it's Britain, it's France, uh, the United States, Canada, uh, Italy, uh, West Germany, I think at the time. So, um, uh, and then some other European countries. And, it, and they're still adding countries. That was part of the problem with Ukraine was this potential that Ukraine could have became a NATO nation. And what underscores that is this one little piece, uh, there's you know, a whole charter and there's you know, this, this, this whole agreement, but Article 5 of the NATO Pact is, uh, states that a attack on one country is considered an attack on all. So, you know, we've talked about alliances before and everything. So if, um, what was some of the little countries, uh, I can't even think of one, the little, the little European country, uh, Belgium. Yeah, well, Belgium, perfect example, because Belgium is where NATO is actually located today. <laughs> Let's say Soviet Union starts messing around with Belgium uh, and attacks Belgium. That pulls all the NATO countries into a war. And basically, Article 5 was written to say, if you mess with Belgium, Soviet Union, you're messing with the United States. Because when it said an attack against 
one is an attack against all, it was basically saying it's an attack against the United States to the Soviet Union. The only time Article 5 has actually ever been invoked, however, ironically, is after um, 9-11, after the terrorist attacks on September, uh, September 11, um, where the United States said, hey, we were attacked, um, and that's why we had German forces in Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan was a NATO operation. The Iraq war was just a U.S. one and, and other allies, but not a NATO operation. Afghanistan, NATO, because the United States was attacked. Anyhow, um, because they're, uh, you know, move these missiles, these ballistic missiles into Turkey and Italy, uh, the Soviet Union got pretty upset uh, that these missiles were, you know, kind of starting to encroach closer and closer towards the Soviet Union. Um, what had just recently happened as well was the uh, Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961, which we talked about, um, you know, the Cuban nationals attempting to uh, overtake Cuba from Fidel Castro. So after that Bay of Pigs uh, invasion, the failed invasion, a, a really disastrous uh, attempt um, Castro decides to offer the Soviet Union to bring ballistic missiles to Cuba to prevent further encroachment by the United States on, on Cuban territory, to prevent another invasion. And of course, the Soviet Union says, hey, that's a great idea. Let's do that. So um, after some uh, spy planes, U-2 spy plane flies really, really, really high and takes pictures um, flying over Cuba, noticed that there was these construction sites going on, and they finally confirmed that there were missiles there uh, in Cuba. They didn't think there was uh, warheads. They just thought there was missiles, and there, there was continued construction. It looked like they were going to bring you know, more missiles, perhaps a, a landing strip for bombers and things like that, Soviet bombers. So uh, Kennedy's um, um, Security Council, his, his sort of elite uh, advisors when it comes to national security, um, they meet to discuss options. One was an invasion of Cuba again, or bombing these sites, which was ruled out. Um, Kennedy wanted to you know, do this as diplomatically as possible. He didn't want to start a war. Um, so what they determined was they were going to quarantine Cuba. And that word is very, very important because they couldn't say blockade. If they said that they were blockading Cuba from the Soviet Union, that's an act of war. And th there would be different consequences. But they could say they were quarantining Cuba from the Soviet Union and preventing further um, delivery of missiles. Well, this is, you know, where the tensions really peak. So they're not allowing Soviets to uh, deliver items to Cuba. Um, and over that 14 days between uh, the end of October and beginning of November, there was multiple negotiations and uh, back and forth between uh, the Soviet government um, and uh, the U.S. government. The political cartoon I have there, that's Nikita Khrushchev on the left, the premier of the Soviet Union at the time, and um, JFK on the right. And of course, they're arm wrestling there. Uh, they're both setting on uh, nuclear missiles. The, the H there stands for H-bomb or hydrogen bomb, a nuclear weapon. And you could see, you know, Kennedy has his finger right above the button uh, with the bomb under Khrushchev. So, um, there were mixed messages um, that caused some issues as well, as far as what was going to happen. But, you know, like the, there was one message that came from the Soviet Union, and then there was another one uh, with sort of different message and information. So it was very, very, very tense. What winds up happening, though, is uh, some agreements between the two nations. Um, the Soviet Union agrees to remove, withdraw the missiles. Um, from Cuba if the United States uh, declared, made a promise that they would no longer attempt to invade Cuba, a public uh, you know, declaration that they would no longer attempt to invade Cuba, which they did. Secretly, 
Um, I guess just to save face with, you know, the U.S. could look better somehow. Um, secretly, the United States removes the missiles from Turkey and Italy later. But that ends, you know, one of the, the tensest moments between uh, the Soviet Union and the United States during the Cold War. Um, now, another international crisis uh, becomes an international crisis for the United States and, and other parts of the world is the Vietnam War. Uh, and dating it is very difficult. Um, you know, historians will typically say maybe 1954, 1955, uh, definitely ends in 1975. That is definitely where it concludes. But actually understanding where and when it starts is, is, is a little rough because of who's involved. So I mentioned this earlier, right? Coming out of World War II, there's a, a power vacuum that's created in Asia because of the withdrawal of, J of Japan, the surrender of J Japanese forces uh, you know, that had something to do with the Korean War. Um, and uh, a lot of these places have been prior European colonies. So, you know, you had colonial rule before that was replaced by imperial rule by Japan. Again, it's, it's, you know, just, just different people subjecting other people to, you know, their laws. Um, but all of a sudden you have whew, this kind of power vacuum. Now in, in um, French Indochina, which is what this area was called, which is Vietnam, North and South, parts of Cambodia and Laos. Um, there's uh, an attempt by France to reestablish their colonies. This is a real dilemma for the United States. Not only is France trying to um, reestablish its colonies in, in this part of the world, in Southeast Asia, Britain is also trying to do the same thing in Malaysia and some other places, uh, Burma. Uh, and it puts the United States in a real bind. The United States had championed this principle of, of self-rule and autonomy, you know, coming from our own history of overthrowing, not overthrowing, but, but, but um, gaining independence from a colonial empire. And uh, you mentioned like in, 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 in Woodrow Wilson's uh, 14 points, there's that same idea that, you know, people should be able to rule themselves and govern themselves. So we have this, this ideology and this principle that, that is driving us. And we don't really want to see France. Uh, France was not a great uh, uh, colonizer to start with. They had lots of problems. Um, we really don't want to see them back there. On the other hand, the problem is we also want a strong Europe. We want a strong Great Britain and a strong France uh, to help us thwart communism. We don't want them falling to communism. We want strong allies in Europe. So the Eisenhower administration basically caves to the idea of allowing Britain and France to recolonize uh, these parts of Southeast Asia. And they offer military assistance and other types of supplies uh, to squelch the, you know, the, the, this, this uh, rebellion that's basically occurring. So as France is trying to reestablish this uh, in the early 1950s, um, they're, you know, really running into a lot of friction uh, against the Vietnamese forces. Um, there's a very large battle in 1954, Gien Bien Phu, I believe, uh, is the location. France at one point asked the United States to drop nuclear weapons uh, to, to use tactical nukes against some of these Vietnamese um, forces. Uh, the United States you know, said, no, that's a horrible idea. Um, and eventually France pieces out, they, they leave, they can't handle it. And um, so there's an attempt to establish a unified Vietnam. But of course, just like before with Korea, there's two governments in Vietnam. There's Ho Chi Minh uh, in North Vietnam, who is supported by uh, the Soviet Union, China. Uh, he's not a dyed in the wool communist. Um, he wants to sort of use that sort of ideology to unify Vietnam. He is not a global communist revolutionary, at least not at the beginning. Um, but he is supported by the Soviet Union and China. And then there's South Vietnam, 
um, that is supported by the U.S. and its allies. Um, the uh, once again, there is a separation between the two that uh, was a line that was drawn during or, or right after World War II, uh, much like Korea. That was basically just an administrative line where you had one group that was, uh, uh, you know, sort of occupying and 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 helping rebuild. Uh, the country on one side and the same on the other. It's 17th par parallel as where it's located. So now you have this division of country and particularly with Ho Chi Minh, he wants to unify Vietnam and he wants a free independent Vietnam. South Vietnam uh, is a, it's a total disaster. Um, the leadership there is very weak. There's multiple turnovers and uh, South Vietnamese leadership over the course of the Vietnam War, there's assassinations. Um, uh, early on, there's coups. Uh, there, there's just all this going on. So there's never a very strong sense of leadership coming from South, which is going to be part of the problem in the long run. But anyhow, they're pro-United States. They're pro-democracy. They're pro-capitalism. So the United States throws in with them. And there's a slow S escalation in the early 1960s. Kennedy is still more worried about Europe, but they're keeping an eye on what's happening in Southeast Asia. They're more worried about Laos early on in the 1960s than they are about Vietnam falling to communism. They think what, the war is going to happen in Laos, not, not in Vietnam. But there is a slow, I don't want to say a buildup of forces, but uh, we, we, there is a increasing amount of support, economic support and military support for Vietnam, for South Vietnam uh, in the form of, you know, aid, military aid, economic aid uh, and advisors. So there are military personnel in Vietnam at this time in the early 60s, but they are training. They serve as advisors. You know, they're just there as counsel and, and things like that. Um, until we get to 1964, when things really start to change. So August 1964, I think it was August 2nd, 1964, there's an incident in the Tonkin Gulf, right off the coast of, of Vietnam. Uh, the, I can't remember the name of the, um, USS Maddox, USS Maddox uh, was attacked um, by three North Vietnamese ships, torpedo ships. Um, there was, you know, fire return. I believe there's actually a few North Vietnamese soldiers killed, uh, some damage to, uh, you know, some of the, 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 the U.S. Uh, ship. Um, it was there in, in the Gulf as a, it was a signal uh, ship. Uh, it was an intelligence ship. So it was listening to radio traffic from the island, uh, you know, picking up uh, stuff like that to, to gather intelligence. Um, and, you know, it had fired warning shots when these bo uh, boats started approaching and then the, the North Vietnamese started returning fire. Two days later on August 4th, there's a perceived attack on the USS Turner Joy, USS Turner Joy. Um, another, you know, signal intelligence ship. Um, there was uh, sonar and radar registers uh, that was in, in, in and radio traffic indicating that there was an attack imminent. Um, and uh, so uh, the, this Navy ship started firing off in the direction of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the sonar registers and everything. Um, but the two combined incidents um, resulted in a resolution by Congress. Uh, and I'll just point out, years later, uh, Robert McNamara, who was the Secretary of Defense at this time, asked General Giap, who was one of the main military leaders of North Vietnam, about what happened on August 4th. And General Giap said, nothing. You guys were firing at absolutely nothing. So kind of like what we talked about in the, in the late 1800s with the, the Spanish-American War, this perceived attack on a U.S. ship that pulled them into the Spanish-American War, uh, this perceived attack on the USS Turner Joy wound up uh, pulling us uh, and, and, and getting us mired in the Vietnam War. 
So uh, the Tonkin Golf Resolution gave uh, uh, President Lyndon B. Johnson uh, this really sweeping powers to uh, provide aid and escalate the war in Vietnam to, you know, pursue victory, uh, to thwart communism, you know, whatever language you want to use there. But he had these great amount of power to start escalating the war further. So over the course of the war, um, there at, at its peak in 1969, there was 543,000 U.S. troops uh, in Vietnam, uh, actively fighting by this time. They were, you know, right alongside uh, South Vietnamese uh, troops. There was, of course, widespread bombing campaigns, uh, one bombing campaign known as Rolling Thunder. It's how does, I don't know how many millions of tons of bombs we dropped uh, in Vietnam over that course of, of, um, of our active participation of about less, less than 10 years where, where we were really fighting. So, um, and as a result, there's, there's over 50,000 uh, U.S. deaths, um, 47,434 actual combat deaths. Uh, much, much more, of course, when it comes to North Vietnamese and, and uh, our allies, South Vietnamese. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, the war uh, probably tomorrow when we get to the end of it um, and the Nixon campaign. So let's talk about this gentleman, Lyndon B. Johnson. Uh, the 36th president of the United States. He uh, assumed office in no on November 22nd. He was he was sworn into uh, uh, the office on Air Force One after the death of President Kennedy. He was reelected in 1964 um, with the sweeping um, uh, majority of states. Once again, um, the states that didn't vote for him were uh, like three or four southern states. Oddly enough, um, he is a Southern Democrat. He is from Texas, um, and he's quite the imposing figure. He knew how to intimidate people. He was 6'4", very tall guy, had that Texas draw, and he was known to do what uh, his uh, peers called the treatment. Uh, and he was not afraid to get in somebody's face. He wouldn't scream, but he would get in your personal space, nose to nose with you. And, um, and evoke any type of emotion you can imagine. Um, and he was, a, he was a smart guy. Like he, he could um, sort of um, foretell what the argument or, or um, counter argument is gonna be from whoever he's, he's, he's giving the treatment to and, and knock them down before they could even speak. And people that witnessed this said, you know, sometimes it'd go on for four hours where he would just, he would just hold court. Uh, there's also some other kind of uh, awkward things that he would do, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that for maybe uh, later uh, or somebody else can tell you about that. But he, um, yeah, again, was a very imposing figure. And the war in Vietnam had really distracted him because he wanted to focus on domestic issues, sort of like Eisenhower um, in a sense, but was really committed to improving things in the United States. He, he, he started his political career during the Great Depression. So he, uh, I think at first was part of a staff of one of the congressmen from Texas, before he's elected in, I think, 1937 to uh, the House of Representatives. So he's witnessing the New Deal. He's witnessing FDR's attempts to, you know, lift the nation out of the Great Depression. <clears throat> the difference in his time, though, is that economically, the United States is going pretty good. And this is why he wants to see more improvement, because for so many, it seems to be going well, but there's, there's, uh, there's a lot also that are struggling still. So he has some sweeping legislation that the U.S. hasn't seen since the Great Depression, since FDR's New Deal, that's uh, kind of encompassed under what's called the Great Society. And there's lots of lots of legislation. I've just 
kind of um, picked out some of the more well-known uh, uh, examples to, to discuss here. His overall goal, however, was to eliminate poverty and bring or and, and uh, eliminate racial injustice. So you know the the um, the civil rights movement is still really hot. Um, there's you know more violence that's happening. There's the Watts riots in, in Los Angeles. There's still a lot of things going on. Eisenhower had um, you know seen through some some civil rights legislation, but really what LBJ does um, has been the most impactful um, over the course of the last uh, 50 some years in some cases. So under that sort of objective uh, of uh, limiting poverty and racial injustice, some of the highlights of so the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, it outlawed discrimination. So you, could, you can't discriminate when you're hiring somebody based on race, color, creed, religion, or sex. Um, and uh, that has been you know, modified. Um, and there are you know, ways that that is now enforced. That did not exist before the Civil Rights Act, right? We we're still dealing with segregation, trying to desegregate the South. But now we're looking at the, the employment practices of private businesses, and we're going to prevent that. So that's outlawed. Um, pro prohibited, of course, you may notice that we've been dealing with this for a while and there's been Supreme Court rulings and there's this legislation, and that legislation uh, in an attempt to continue to seek racial justice, right, to eliminate racial injustice. But uh, here we're prohibiting unequal voter application and registration. We can still see that as an issue today, right? Um, but that was something that we've discussed going back to the 1800s with the poll tax and, and things like that. There's nothing so heavy handed in, in 1960s, but um, there are ways that to undermine um, the, uh, the registration of, of minority voters. Um, it's something that we still encounter today in certain ways, uh, either through gerrymandering districts, uh, which I'll talk about when we get more into um, uh, our civics part, talking about Congress and how we elect officials, um, and um, just making it difficult to register, you know, requiring uh, ID. And now I'm one, you know, I, I don't see a problem with asking somebody for a form of ID when you go to the polls. The problem, though, is that people don't have access to getting IDs. Um, you move, you know, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the DMV or, or, or a state office where you can get just a, a photo ID uh, and you don't have them where people can readily get them. Uh, they're not necessarily cheap. Um, and there's ways then that you can basically very nuanced keep people from voting. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, requiring voter uh, or, or requiring, you know, identification, a photo ID when you vote. Again, I don't have a problem with that, but you better do a darn better job of allowing people to get access to identification than you have now. That is not by accident why they do that. Um, so there's attempts to eliminate things like that. Um, segregation, still an issue. We're going to talk about a lovely gentleman named George Wallace here in a minute, who was the governor of Alabama uh, that was just elected in 1964. Um, and when I get to it, we'll talk about it. But why this is still happening, you know, we're still struggling uh, to eliminate segregation, eliminate uh, these racial injustices. And of course, another big part of that was the war on poverty. So uh, sweeping legislation and the creation of, of um, offices, of organizations to deal with poverty and joblessness and job training. And these are just a few highlights. So the Job Corps, um, where People, I think, uh, I don't know if it's still the same. At that time, it was from ages 16 to 24, could get um, job training, 
uh, and and uh, help finding a job. Um, there was something else called VISTA, which was sort of like an American Peace Corps where you had volunteers, rather than going abroad to help people, they were helping people uh, in uh, the United States. Upward Bound, um, which is rolled into uh, sort of like a, a trio of, of um, organizations now, but that was to help get um, minorities uh, access to higher education, to help provide financial aid for them, help them get ready to attend college, which is, which is still an organization. Community action agencies and community action programs. Um, before I moved to Dublin, uh, my wife and I worked for HAPCAP, which is Hawkins, Hawking Athens Perry Community Action Program. Um, and they had a variety of programs under that to help their community. We worked, you know, Athens is one of the poorest counties in Ohio uh, and, you know, Hawking and Perry is not very far behind to be truthful. Um, and um, I worked in an energy assistance office. So through federal grants, federal programs, we were able to assist people with their utility bills, electric bill and gas bill. Uh, we provided air conditioners for um, the elderly uh, and people with medical conditions. Um, you could, you know, qualify for one, you know, every so often. Um, and then once, uh, I think every six months, we would, we would just straight up pay your electric bill if you were current. Like if you hadn't fought, well, I think we actually had some other means as well. Like if you had fallen behind <laughs> to uh, so much money that we would pay to make sure that you had your utility stay on. And then there was other programs um, through um, AEP and like Columbia Gas where we would get you on like an assistance program where there was a percent that you would pay and there was a percent that uh, that uh, the, basically the um, the power company or the gas company would would negotiate for you to you know keep a keep your lights on as long as you can <laughs> current on your bills and over time help you pay off any amount that you may have accrued that was just one program um, there was others one of the other programs that we had at hapcap that i think all of you are probably familiar with head start <laughs> um, basically the whole uh franklin county child development council uh my job <laughs> Uh, and, and just the fact that, uh, you know, we have this opportunity, um, basically we can point right back to the great society legislation, uh, in 64 and 65, uh, when I went for, uh, uh well, working at HAPCAP, there's a picture of, uh, uh, LBJ, uh, that was in our break room, uh, signing in to law, uh, this, this particular bit of legislation. When I went to do uh, orientation at uh, the, the Child Development Council, um, we had a little bit on LBJ and the Great Society, which, which, which basically paved the way for that organization at Head Start. Um, most of the employees I was with are actually you know, uh, Head Start employees. Um, but so you know, really aimed at that. The Great Society, even that term, uh, that was coined uh, when he delivered the um, the commencement speech at Ohio University in Athens. Um, so Ohio, in particular, for some reason, just has uh, you know, it just really has a stamp in the great society. Other things um, for sometimes better and sometimes worse, uh, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Um, so more federal aid provided to um, public schools. Um, this is really the first time that we have standardization, um, looking at, at, at standard achievements that were expectations for all school districts across the US. I mentioned with Eisenhower, there was investment in science, technology, engineering, and, and math, you know, around the space race, um, which had given federal money to elementary and secondary schools. But now, it's, it's, it's about equality too, and the quality of education that each student is getting. So um, now 
that's where we get some of the standardized testing that, you know, our, our, our little ones get to do every so often uh, to see how well they're developing, how well, well that they compare to, you know, state by state and even district by district and things like that. There's due criticism for, you know, some of the programs, some of the, you know, the ways uh, things have been handled from time to time. Uh, it it, it it's, seems a little contradictory the way funds are provided. Um, you know, you would want schools that struggle to receive more funding. However, it's since it's based on scoring a lot, schools that are already doing well wind up with more federal aid uh, and, and, and assistance than some schools that are struggling more. Um, and there's other things, you know, today's world, it's, you know, there's always an agenda. So apparently we're, you know, uh, all the all the public school students are, are following some type of uh, agenda, whatever it may be. Um, but uh, in some cases, there is, you know, some legitimate criticism as far as, you know, all these standards and things that, uh, you know, metrics and, and, and measurements uh, sometimes can can mask some of the issues and, and uh, you know, quantitative information doesn't always um, answer all the questions. <clears throat> and then finally, healthcare was also an, a, a large issue uh, for the Great Society as well. So we get uh, Medicare and Medicaid uh, out of the Great Society, which was originally part of Social Security, uh, but it's actually moved under its own office now or under a different office than Social Security. So even with sort of an international crisis with Vietnam, uh, even though he wanted to focus more on domestic uh, issues, he did achieve quite a bit. Um, but particularly when it comes to Vietnam, uh, opinions are changing about LBJ. Uh, the war early on, uh, 64, 65, 66, um, overwhelming majority of Americans are in support of the war. Um, I think in 1965, um, at some point, the number one song in the country was by um, Staff Sergeant Barry Sadler, The Ballad of the Green Berets. Um, which, you know, comes directly out of, of Vietnam. Um, so, you know, we often see this idea of the anti-war movement, but it doesn't come until a little bit later. You know, when, when the war starts, most Americans are like, okay, let's go do this. We're, we're, we're with you. We're behind you. Um, by 1967, we're starting to see, well, okay, this is starting to drag on and we're not seeing a lot of success. So we, it was more about we need to do something different rather than I don't support the war anymore. But there was they were starting to see some chinks in the armor, so to speak. And then we get to what's known as the Tet Offensive, um, which went on from January 68 to September of 1968. Um, the Tet Offensive was this coordinated attack of the North Vietnamese army and the Viet Cong. The Viet Cong were basically largely South Vietnamese um, citizens that were basically a paramilitary uh, with support from North Vietnam. But there's this, this uh, coordinated attack across South Vietnam that hits 100 South Vietnamese cities. Um, so it's a widespread, uh, massive, basically invasion of South Vietnam by North Vietnam and mostly Viet Cong, but there are North Vietnamese, uh, the North Vietnamese army that is involved as well. Um, when it's all said and done, it was actually not successful. And the Viet Cong basically were destroyed um, through that. They were not much of an issue anymore. However, by that time, the North Vietnamese army uh, had grown in size and, and uh, was receiving quite a lot of aid from the Soviet Union and China. Um, but this, again, was a huge sort of um, uh, issue for, uh, you know, public opinion. This, 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 you know, what's going on in, in South Vietnam? How is this happening? Um, there was other scandals. Um, the My Lai Massacre 
and I won't get into much detail about that, was basically a, a mass murder of, of South Vietnamese villagers uh, by the U.S. Army that were were or were not mistaken as, as a North Vietnamese village. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, the sort of brutality shown there uh, by American soldiers also really, you know, did not set well with Americans. And um, another uh, issue was with CBS anchor, was he a CBS? I think he was a CBS, Walter Cronkite, uh, who was the, the evening news anchor um, and offered basically an editorial one night that was talking about this quagmire, the stalemate uh, uh, of the war. He was considered America's most trusted newsman. Uh, everybody liked Walter Cronkite. Um, and after he had sort of dressed down the uh, war effort, uh, LBJ even said, well, if we've lost Cronkite, we've lost the war. So the opinion is changing by the late 60s. Which is really where we start seeing the anti-war movement. And it's not exclusive to, but college campuses are a ripe environment for this type of activity. Um, <clears throat> you know, whatever the ideology is, when you have a group of young, passionate, ideological people um, to, you know, sort of uh, touch off a movement, um, you know, they're going to run with. It. And the anti-war movement really grabs young people. So there's a lot of, of protests, there's sit-ins, all this stuff is happening near and around college campuses. Um, it kind of dovetails with the civil rights movement. There's a civil rights aspect to it as well. So those two sort of, of mesh from time to time um, and, and are somewhat aligned. Um, so yeah, things are starting to sort of fall apart for LBJ. And a lot of it has to do with the um, disfavor now of that's, that's creeping in around the Vietnam War. There's still a lot of support as well, particularly from conservatives, from, from other you know, uh, groups, but uh, uh, with young people, it's becoming less and less favorable. And then we're heading towards the 1968 presidential election. Now, again, LBJ had won Almost, you know, like I, I think he won 45 states at least uh, during his his uh, election in 1964 after taking office from Kennedy. And as I've said a couple of times here, he qualified to run again. He served less than 24 months of, of JFK's um, uh, term. So he qualified to run again. But there's some splits in the Democratic Party. Um. There's, there's some, some real issues there. And usually when you have a sitting president, the uh, party and members of his party will not challenge his reelection, right? Nobody, when Obama re, you know, ran again, there wasn't a Democrat, you know, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton didn't stand up and say, hey, yeah, no, I'm going to run against you. Usually everybody throws in their lot behind that president. Not always. There's always some goofball challenger, knucklehead, you know, they're, 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 they always try to pull something, but the, the, uh, um, the, the party as a whole will tend to throw its support behind that person. Now, behind the scenes, there might be, you know, some suggestions and things like that, but particularly publicly, there are going to throw their support behind that. Um, not so much in 1968. There were some concerns, uh, and there was some early polling and uh, some primaries where LBJ didn't do so well. He still won, but not by the margins that they'd expected. And some of the people that he had an uh, issue with was Eugene McCarthy. Um, so the names I have uh, down the side here, uh, Hubert Humphrey was LBJ's vice president. Okay, we'll come back to him. Eugene McCarthy was sort of a labor movement guy um, and, uh, you know, was sort of, you know, kind of fishing around 
for you know possibility of running against and, and challenging LBJ in 1968. And then we get George Wallace. Um, George Wallace was ran as an independent. He had been a Democrat. <clears throat> he ran and won the uh, 1964 Alabama uh, governorship. He was the governor of Alabama and he won on a platform of segregation. In his inaugur inauguration speech, he said segregation uh, in the past, segregation now, segregation forever. Um, so we know where he's coming from and we know why he's splitting from the Democratic Party. You know, LBJ, a, a Texas Democrat, a Southern Democrat, had just signed all the civil rights legislation and all this stuff. So George Wallace is throwing his hat in the ring as an independent, but had been a former Democrat. Um, and again, I think we know what his platform is. Um, what makes him better is that his running mate, the guy he chose as vice president, was um, Curtis LeMay, former General Curtis LeMay. Curtis LeMay uh, came to sort of, uh, had, had made his name during the uh, World War II as uh, one of the proponents of firebombing Japan. He is later uh, through the 1950s, the commander of strategic air command. And why that is important, strategic air command basically had uh, control of most nuclear weapons. Um, you know, as I mentioned, bombers early on were the main means. Uh, and he was a proponent for the continued exploration of, of nuclear weapons. And as the, um, the commander of Strategic Air Command, he really professionalized and, and upgraded the Air Force to maintain this sort of prominence as the country's nuclear force. Um, so under George Wallace and Curtis LeMay, you had a promise of segregation and nuclear war. I don't know why the United States just didn't go with that. Um, so yeah, really, really two lovely individuals uh, that, that just paired so well together. Um, uh, if anything, um, we can we can we can sort of uh, um, snicker a little bit. George Wallace was shot later on, um, a few years later, and spent the uh, the remainder of his life in a wheelchair. So you know, karma. Anyway. Um, and then there's one more gentleman uh, that had thrown his hat in the ring that was causing some some division. Uh, um, Robert Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, uh, name probably sounds familiar because he is the younger brother of John F. Kennedy. He was the attorney general for JFK, um, a position that he probably was not qualified for. And there was some uh, some criticism of nepotism, but he was well liked. And um, he kind of threw his name in a little bit late. And uh, some of his other, uh, some of the other people that were, were, were campaigning at the time criticized him as just being an opportunist. Um, he largely had a platform similar to uh, his brother and uh, more so with LBJ, you know, continuous idea of, of racial uh, justice, um, he was probably less of a hawk than his brother had been when it came to, you know, fighting communism and, and war. Um, but he had struggled in some of the primaries. He had lost to um, McCarthy. Now, at some, some point over that year, uh, LBJ finally decides that he is not going to rerun. Um, a lot of that has to do with the shifting opinion on Vietnam. He is also worried about his health. He's not sure he's going to survive another four years. Um, and if you've ever seen a president uh, that serves eight years, uh, you know, compare the pictures side by side of what they look like when they went into office when they came out. Uh, you know, I think most people with that type of stress and responsibility do not age well uh, in that time. He was also had been, he wasn't at this time, in, in the 50s when he was a senator, he was a three-pack-a-day smoker uh, and suffered a massive heart attack 
um, and had, uh, you know, after that decided to quit smoking, tried to get a little healthier, um, but, you know, wasn't particularly a young man. Um, that's relative to the time um, compared to, you know, our last few presidents or last two presidents. Um, he did actually have a heart attack and die in 1972. So he wasn't far off. Um, well, no, he would have. Yeah, I think actually had he had he been reelected, he would have he would have died in office. Um, but um, so there's this, you know, race heating up now about who's going to be the uh, incumbent who, or who's going to run in his place. And, you know, Robert Kennedy throwing his name in also continues to divide the the party. I mean, he is the he's the brother of JFK, one of the most beloved presidents of his day. Um, you know, he's got that look, he's got that, that accent, everything going for him. Um, and then he's assassinated, uh, in June of 1968, only months after the assassination of, uh, Martin Luther King. So 1968 in particular was a bad, bad year. Um, just as far as the morale of the country. Um, you know, the, the mired in, in the war, uh, the loss of a civil rights leader earlier, and then the loss again of a Kennedy, um, you know, this, which just becomes more and more of a tragic story. Uh, if you ever look at anything about the Kennedy family, the, the, the death that sort of surrounded them. Um, constantly and particularly with with um, you know some of them dying very young and and before their time uh, he's assassinated by Sirhan Sirhan who was a uh, Palestinian national um, so that continues to sort of creates chaos within the Democratic Party and eventually however um, and not real surprising Hubert Humphrey gets the nomination um, as, you know, being the, the vice president. Once again, usually a pretty good bet um, for, a, uh, um, for a presidential run if you have been vice president. It's almost expected if, you know, you have been the, the vice president for two terms and that president can't run anymore. I mean, there's there's been several. Uh, uh, Al Gore, of course, uh, would have been the most recent. Um, George H. W. Bush before that. You know, uh, Richard Nixon uh, is was vice president under Eisenhower, uh, who is going to win the 1968 election. Um, so Humphrey, uh, just because of this sort of chaos in the Democratic Party. Um, and the splits that are occurring, um, and not to mention the fact that you know George Wallace, as a as a Southern candidate, uh, you know takes away some of those states. Um, uh, Humphrey loses to uh, Richard Nixon in '68. Richard Nixon becomes president in 1969. Part of his campaign is to Vietnamize. The Vietnamization of the Vietnam War, meaning he's going to turn it over to the South Vietnamese. He campaigns on getting the United States out of Vietnam, um, which we will deal with tomorrow. So that gets us pretty much through the 1960s, a really tumultuous time. Uh, as I mentioned, a, a time of progress in many ways. Um, it, it, it's really uh, you know, things happening in the background. Every time that you, I, I've had a difficult time trying to share this with you because every time I think, okay, I could talk about this, but if I start talking about this, there's this other stuff happening simultaneously with that. So that's why I've kind of gone back and forth. Things like, you know, we had the civil rights movement going on, but at the same time, you have the Cuban Missile Crisis and you have this war in, in Vietnam while, you know, we're trying to address things in, you know, and of course, any time is like that, we're, you know, we're, we're in a time like that now, you know, e every decade is going to have that, but particularly with the 60s, there's just so much happening that um, to sort of uh, uh, 
be able to discuss it and give it all justice is kind of difficult. But anyway, um, any questions on uh, the uh, sort of peak of the Vietnam War, uh, the presidency of LBJ? Nope. Okay. All right. So let's take us about, uh, we'll go to 125 for a break and we'll come back for language arts. And today we're going to be comparing literary works. So I'll see you guys at 125. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.